afternoon and thank you everybody for attending the talk and for giving me for giving me the opportunity to share some science with all of you and this is so exciting as Stacy said before today is the 10th anniversary of the Juno launch so it's very special and very exciting to me so that's uh, thank you so much so here I'm gonna give a little overview of the Juno mission and why we study Jupiter. So Jupiter, it's a planet that has been known uh, by already by the ancients. And it's, the, it's a planet that we can uh, see uh, with the naked eye since it, like forever. It's the brightest spot that we can see on the sky. So we see uh, the interior planet, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then we have Jupiter, which is the first giant planet. And it's the most massive planet in our solar system and it has the most extended structure in our solar system. I will mention what this means later. But the, the important thing is, it's something that we can see also with the naked eye. So Jupiter has uh, 318 times the Earth's mass, and it's uh, 11 times the Earth radius, so it's really huge. And it rotates every 10 hours. So Earth rotates every 24 hours and Jupiter, which is massive and much uh, bigger, rotates much faster, which one can think, okay, every 10 hours. And the revolution around the sun is 12 years for us. Um, why do we go to, to Jupiter? Why is it important to study Jupiter? What you are seeing here is just a visualization of the formation of the solar system. When the solar system form, many of the rocks and particles, depending on the materials, they were accreted closer to the sun or farther to the sun, as we are gonna see uh, like in two seconds. So heavy rocks or heavy elements were accreted closer to the sun and lighter elements like hydrogen uh, were accreted farther to the sun. That's uh, like Jupiter. Jupiter is a giant planet formed by gas mostly. And there is a huge discontinuity that we see here where these heavy elements and lighter elements form. And Jupiter, it's exactly after that discontinuity for if we look from the sun. And why it's important that we study Jupiter because it's exactly at that spot where this differentiation is made or was made, and it has the secret. So it contains the secrets of the formation of the solar system. This is not only about the formation on, on the structure of the giant planets, but also will give us clues of the formation of our solar system, which is very important. Uh, this is what you are seeing here in the screen. It's uh, the different missions that have explored the Jovian system. So the first one was Galileo Galilei in the 1600s with the telescopes. And then there have been a series of um, missions that have visited this system, like the flybys, like just passing by to uh, uh, passing by Jupiter. We have probably, you remember Pioneer 10 or 11 and Voyager 1 and 2 and others like Cassini. And then at the top, we have missions that are orbiting or that have been orbiting the Jovian system. The first one was Galileo and now we have Juno there. Juno has been orbiting there for five years already. And so as you can see, there are not many that we didn't really know much about Jupiter in detail because there was not a mission dedicated to understand this planet. As we said before, T minus 10. Well, what you are nine, hearing here eight, is the launch seven, of six, uh, five, Juno four, to space three, exactly 10 two, years ago. One ignition ignition and, and then we go to space of the atlas 5 with juno on a trek to jupiter i hope you are listening you are hearing what uh, the, the reporter is saying but then program, uh, the, the spacecraft was good. released in the space and then it started the, the trip the journey 
to to do that already 10 years ago how was this journey so let's look at this just uh, wiggles here we have uh, the launch on uh, august uh, 5th in 2011 and then it had to do some sort of trip to go again closer to earth or like two years later to get some sort of acceleration to be able to go to uh, deeper space and reach uh, Jupiter on the 4th of July of 2016. So it took five years to arrive to Jupiter, which of course it, it's kind of, of, of far, right? And then once Juno uh, reach Jupiter, this uh, the spacecraft is orbiting the planet every 53 days. It's trying to wrap the planet, what you are seeing in this image, every of these, each of these lines are referring to each of the orbits that Juno is doing. So in a way that we wrap the planet in order to have uh, um, the most precise overview um, of the interior and the environment and the, with the moons, and whatever is outside in the universe, but mostly to understand the interior. That's why all these orbits are planned this way that you are seeing, like exactly equidistant or like same space between the different orbits. In reality, this is how the orbit looks like. So with this little thing is representing Juno, you know, and then at some point it reaches Jupiter, and um, we said before that Jupiter is really huge, but Juno is really fast when it reaches Jupiter and it gets close to the planet. It takes only two hours to go from pole to pole, and then it goes again far away, and it takes 53 days until it reaches Jupiter again. And it gets really close to Jupiter to understand the environment better. You may be thinking, okay, how does this uh, spacecraft uh, look looks like this is how it looks like for you to see the scale this is a little man I, I hope you are seeing my cursor if that's not the case please let me know but oh, let me see this is a, a human sized person and then uh, you know is characterized by the, these three solar panels as you saw before in the video Juno was uh, launched in this huge rocket but all of these um, arms of solar panels were folded and they were unfolded when it reached the space in order to be able to, to launch it properly. Juno has, I think it's a, at least eight instruments and a camera. And these instruments measure, for example, gravity or magnetism or the kind of particles like electrons or, or if, there are some waves that Jupiter produces. And in particular, I work on this instrument here that is called magnetometer. This is just uh, something to mention. In terms of the mission overview, Juno is the first solar power mission to Jupiter. Uh, it has this science instrument, but uh, plus the camera, which is just this camera that is taking the amazing pictures of Jupiter that I will show later during the presentation. It took five years to get to Jupiter and it makes uh, these 53 day orbits. Um, uh, something to mention is that uh, Juno should have finished like last month, uh, but the spacecraft is performing so uh, very well and is giving us so amazing data that we can continue producing uh, results and understanding the all the secrets of Jupiter and the solar system that NASA now extended the mission until 2025, which is amazing. Um, the main objective of the mission is to improve our understanding of the formation of giant planets and the evolution and origin of Jupiter, the interior structure, the atmosphere, because the atmosphere of Jupiter is characterized by huge storms, like very high speed winds, 
it's like a crazy world in that respect in terms of the atmosphere. And the other thing to study is the magnetosphere, which I will mention later what this means. The project is managed by mostly by NASA and Scott Bolton is the PI and Jack Conan is a co-I on this. They are in charge of the mission, let's say, but there are hundreds of people dedicated to this mission. Scientists, engineers, technicians, people from operations. This is a huge team and this is a huge effort, a team effort. Yeah. So why Juno? We want to know how the Jupiter formed, how the planet is arranged inside, what is in below those clouds. Uh, does it have a solid core? Is all gas up to you know the center of the planet? How everything is generated, how deep these storms go. Uh, there are many questions that need to be answered, that we are answering uh, like more and more as the data is coming. In terms of the interior of Jupiter, I'm going to show here some for you to see the comparison for, with Earth. That's what we have at the left. The only thing that I want you to remember is that we have an outer layer on Earth that is solid, and that is called crust. And then we have other layers that are fluid or viscous, and then something else called core at the center of the planet the inner core, which is solid again. In terms of Jupiter, before Juno was sent there, it was assumed that uh, we have mostly um, atmosphere kind of gas uh, layer, and then some sort of liquid layer, and then a very small inner core, which is solid. That was before Juno was uh, launched. And I will show you how things have changed after we received the data. So the other thing, as I said, is how did these, the winds, this is how Jupiter looks like in a, on a telescope. We have these bands and zones that are characterized by um, a darker area or whiter areas. And these are winds that are traveling in opposite direction. The other thing that is very particular in Jupiter is the Great Red Spot, which has a huge storm. It's several times the size of our planet, of Earth, and it has been there for centuries. It's just, you know, rotating with the rest of the atmosphere, and it's just huge. So how does this work? This is, these are other questions. And the other thing is the, the concept of magnetosphere that I mentioned earlier. Uh, our planet Earth has, uh, is in the interior, it's like a huge magnet and create a shield. These lines are, ref are reflection somehow uh, giving you an idea of this shield and the space inside this shield is our home. So Jupiter, so Jupiter has a huge shield and that shield reaches Saturn's orbit. It's really huge. The, one, the, the, the other thing I want you to keep in mind if like, it's like without that magnetic shield, life is not possible on our planet or in any other plan, planet or moon. In case of, of Jupiter, we know it doesn't, it doesn't contain life because it, it doesn't have a surface. Winds are crazy in speed. It doesn't have the properties to contain life, but it has a huge shield and it's covering, it's protecting some of the moons who, which can contain life. So this is something that we study also with Juno and it's like a hundred times larger than Earth, this shield for you to have a, an, a, an idea. And the shield rotates with the planet as well. And that's the, the area that I, I work on. That's why I, I take more time to talk about this. This map, it's showing you the different partners that are involved in Juno. I work as well as Stacy and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center here. 
but it's a huge international effort and also inside the within the us we have many institutions involved and then in europe we have in italy in denmark in france um as i said this is a huge team working uh, really to a, a huge position and supporting each other for everything to work. So at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, we work on this instrument called magnetometer, and that's the one that is studying that shield. Now the importance of that shield and how these shields uh, is interacting with all the moons. So what have we learned? from uh, uh, Jupiter since we have Juno there. You may have seen some uh, auroras, these very no the northern lights, these very beautiful light uh, in the atmosphere on Earth. So this is giving you an idea of the Earth's size and the aurora in the northern hemisphere. And what you are seeing here is uh, it's in real scale to, in comparison with Earth of what Jupiter's aurora looks like, which is huge. If we, it's several times Earth's size. And also on Earth, the auroras only appears in, cer in certain conditions. But in Jupiter, they are there 24-7 all the time, which is very interesting. And with the different instruments, we can look at the poles and look at this northern light with different uh, with different views. For example, the left one is an what we call a, an infrared image, and with this we can see the depth of the three dimensional view of the auroras. The one in the middle is uh, when we take a picture of Jupiter and what we see. If we can distinguish some of the storms here, as you see in the in the same pole as here, and the one at the right, this is an ultraviolet filter. So we see when particles are reaching the atmosphere and creating, uh, being responsible for the emission of these northern lights, this aurora. This is a closer view of the aurora area which is always there. And there are other spots like this one that you see a very bright spot with a little tail. This, for example, it's related to the moon Io. And there is a strong link, a strong relationship between Io and Jupiter. And this spot with the little tail rotates with uh, the orbit of Io, like also being part of the aurora but it rotates while the one in the center is always there. Um, what you see at the left now is the South Pole, the center is the North Pole, and they are, as you see, all the storms here, they like hurricanes, they look very different than the equator. And that's something that we need to understand with these dynamics of the atmosphere and how the clouds and, and everything works. We have the circumpolar cyclones, and that is very interesting. These two images that you are seeing here are reflecting also the storms on, on the North and South Pole. Um, for example, the North Pole is one storm in the middle surrounded by five storms around, and it's different than the South Pole, which is one storm in the middle and much more storms surrounding this one. And this is very dynamic. And now let me show you, I think this is the, yeah, this is one of my favorite uh, videos of uh, Juno with this kind of uh, data, the Giron data, trying, what we are doing here is a journey to the North Pole, where we are gonna visit some of these storms. And with this instrument with Giron, we can understand the three-dimensional structure of these storms. So the darker areas are closer to the surface than the brighter areas. And these are huge storms. The, I think the slowest uh, wind speed is already double of the highest uh, wind speed measured on Earth, which is crazy. So I don't think we wanna go there on holidays. This uh, we will be, you know, flying away. Uh, 
So the, here we are seeing all the structure of these uh, storms. And it's very dynamic because every time that Juno passes by, uh, we see a different structure or different uh, position of these storms, which is very interesting. So we can understand the wind speed or um, densities of elements and so on. Then uh, Juno also study this great red spot the huge storm we mentioned earlier, that it's several times the size of Earth, which is uh, rotating on Jupiter for centuries. So, so you know, uh, with Juno you know instruments, we have seen that the, the structure of this storm reaches at least 350 kilometers from the surface of the planet, from the, the top of the planet. And in this video, this is a, uh, like a visualization of um, us just uh, going into the clouds. We are looking at the clouds and we are going to go in the clouds inside the atmosphere. Um, we are going to see that the temperature increases really a lot in maybe like the 200, uh, five, uh, yeah, 200 kilometers, it increases like 500 degrees. Uh, and then we are penetrating in the red spot area and going out again. And then we are going out at the area of the great red spot. Just a, visual, a, a nice visualization of how the, the atmosphere will look like up to 200 kilometers, 250 kilometers step, if we will be able to go there. This is only a visualization of how we think it is based on Juno data. The, only, uh, the other fun fact of Jupiter's atmosphere is that we identify lightning, and a lot of lightning, like on Earth when we have storms. And we identify this lightning uh, using cameras and using uh, radio receivers. Because these radio, these storms, or when this lightning is produced, it releases some sort of radio receiver, the, uh, of or radio waves, sorry. And then we can observe this. And there is a lot of lightning happening. And what have we learned about the interior? We still need more data from the extended mission to understand, to better understand the far interior of the planet. But what we can say, uh, what we have detected until now is that, okay, we have the top layer, which is this gas area with the storms, and then some sort of liquid parts below that. And then we have a core. It seems like we have a very small core, dense rock, rocky and icy core. And then above that, there is another uh, part of this core, which is more liquid, but it's diffused. So it's some sort of like melting into this other layer, which is more liquid. But still, we need to, to it's, it looks like there is not a distinct core like it happens on Earth, but we need more data. And now we go to the magnetic field. This is a, maybe it's just a complex, uh, topic, but uh, the, what I want to say is that the magnet inside the planet that is creating the magnetic shield that we have, this is not symmetric. It's much stronger in the northern part. Let me go here. It's much stronger in the northern part than in the south. Uh, and that is very interesting because this also affects how the moons interact with uh, Jupiter. And then let me uh, introduce you to Jupiter's family. So we have Jupiter and here you are seeing four of the, uh, of all the moons of Jupiter's moon, moons. But Jupiter has more than 16 moons. This, I selected these four because they have the highest interaction or the strongest interaction with Jupiter and in particular, uh, Io. Io is close to Jupiter, and because it's close, the gravity forces makes this moon, which is 
like some sort of like earth-like with a crust. This crust breaks apart because of this gravity force and it releases a lot of material into space. So Io releases eject one ton per second of volcanic gas. And that uh, contains some particles that uh, this is a representation of what we, we, we call the Io flux tube. So these particles travel along the, or they, they are trapped with this, by this magnetic shield and they travel uh, from Io to Jupiter's atmosphere and they create the part of the aurora, this uh, little point and tail that rotates with the planet. This, this image that we saw before. So these particles that uh, travel from Io or for example, Europa or other moons, they create this part of the aurora that rotates with the planet, the little spot with the tail. And that's one of the things that, uh, that I study. Somehow we can say that uh, Jupiter and the moons talk to each other. And then we are, we are gonna see this because that conversation is reflected by, by radio waves. This is what you are listening here. That's Jupiter IO interaction. This is a conversation. This is a conversation happening between Jupiter and Io because of these electrons traveling to, from one side to the other, these particles. Um, so studying these waves that we receive like in a radio, uh, we can detect not only in Jupiter, but in other parts of the space. If we detect these waves, and that means that that planet that we are observing can be a planet outside of this of, of our solar system. It contains a magnetic shield. It has a magnetic field with that shield. So that means in potentially it's a potential place for life. So it, it's, we learn also from Juno and Jupiter. What we learn from there, we can extrapolate this for other planets, even outside of the solar system. The, the last thing I'm gonna um, talk about is the JunoCam. The JunoCam is the camera that takes uh, amazing pictures that we are gonna say we are gonna see now. This amazing the, this JunoCam is for uh, public. It's for the public, so you can go to this web page, download the raw image, and play with the image and create something wonderful, as you will see here. So we we don't really use this for science. So this is more a public program, but sometimes uh, we are getting more and more introducing this for, for some sort of understanding the, the storm. These are pictures that are taken true color. Uh, that's one thing. You know, it's a rotating a spacecraft and it rotates every 30 seconds. So taking the raw image, um, taking, uh, applying filters and processing the images is not an easy task, but there are uh, very uh, amazing people out there in the public which are doing a wonderful job. Like, look at this amazing picture of, of Jupiter where we can see, see all the storms here. All of these are storms and winds. Or this fantastic composition where you are seeing here is the South Pole. And then this is a, a, a Juno pass from pole to pole, North Pole. It's a Juno is approaching. So we see a little part of the planet and then we get closer to the planet. This is closer to the planet. So we, we see, a, a, let's say a smaller area. And then we go again far away from the planet as we reach the, the South Pole. This is a northern turbulent region, wonderful uh, structures of hurricanes. This is a, more like an artistic or paint-like filter. Some others in the public go to the images and identify fun facts like a dolphin jumping on the sea. 
See, and this is only just a, a storm, but it looks like a dolphin jumping on sea. Or some others try to represent uh, Bangkok, uh, Jupiter storms. And others try to, yes, uh, understand the direction of rotation and interaction between the different, or among the different storms. So it's not very, it's really cool for a public uh, outreach camera. Look at the great red spot. This is all done by, by the public. Um, just to finish, so the Juno mission, I said before, it should have finished in July, right? But if we have an extended mission, but at some point, Juno uh, will end. And at that time, Juno will have to crash into Jupiter. And this is done because of planetary protection. We cannot have a spacecraft without fuel and without control crashing on one of the Jovian moons, like Europa, which is a potential for containing life because it's mostly made of water. So it, we need to crash the spacecraft to destroy it when we have control on it before it contaminates a, a potential uh, place that we need to study. And that's it. So thank you so 